Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, over a million people in southern Madagascar are going hungry and 500,000 children under the age of five are at risk of being acutely malnourished. The humanitarian crisis has several causes, but the headlines have called it the world's first climate change famine. I'll be finding out what's really happening on the ground during a discussion with Jen Benoit Manez, the deputy representative of UNICEF Madagascar. And the average cost of a UK home currently stands at £263,000, 7.1% higher than it was this time last year. Ugo Arinze, the managing director of Onyx Property Team, will be joining me in the studio for the latest insights on Britain's real estate market. Also on the show, I'll be speaking with Ohenetega Iotim, one of the top 20 African entrepreneurs selected to compete for 300,000 US dollars in Jack Ma's African Business Hero Awards. He'll be joining me from Lagos. But first, as always, let's start the show with business news from here in the UK, where, according to a leading business lobby group, major labour shortages are causing severe disruption to the country's economic recovery. The Confederation of British Industry has warned the government that the short haul of 100,000 HGV drivers could take up to two years to resolve if ministers fail to relax post-Brexit immigration rules, which would allow EU drivers from the continent to come back to help resolve distribution issues. In other British business news, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has confirmed that controversial new tax rates will come into force from April 2022. Millions of workers from across the country will now have to pay hundreds of pounds extra a year towards their national insurance contributions to fund wide-sweeping social care reforms. One British business group described the move as ill-timed and illogical as firms are just emerging from the pandemic. Well, for more on this ongoing story, I'm now being joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, it kind of feels as if uh, the Prime Minister may have uh, got a lot of people on his side with this one. Yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because conservatism um, is always thought of, Conservative Party, as the party that does not raise taxes, wants smaller government, wants the government to do less and people to keep more of their money. Well, this is going against all of that. And obviously, we've seen over the last 12, 16 months, fiscally, the government have been throwing money around in the pandemic to obviously try and alleviate some of the people who are, who are losing their jobs and trying to help people out. So this seems to be like a, a very different kind of Conservative Party than the one we've been used to. Um, the new taxes will raise £12 billion per year to try to help help pay for social care. Um, that includes capping costs in England at £86,000. So after that, lo local authorities will pay for people's um, care in the care system. Um, the uh, national insurance that you mentioned is going to rise by 1.25%, um, which um, working people and their employers will pay um, uh, benefits like the state pension from next April. Um, this will cost £255 a year for anyone earning £30,000 or over and £500 a year for everyone, anyone earning over £500. Uh, £50,000 a year. There has been criticism from um, other parties and from across the board, really. UK uh, Home Care Association saying that it's nowhere near enough um, and you think of £12 billion to help pay for social care across uh, the United Kingdom. It doesn't sound like a lot, really. Um, Unison, Unison, which is a union for care workers, said the money doesn't even come close. Um, and Labour's um, Sir Keir Starmer said it targeted young people um, and workers rather than those with the broadest shoulders. I think the um, a little bit of analysis on this, it's the first government that's really tried to do this, tackle this pro problem in decades. Um, so you've got to point that out. And this was in their manifesto. Um, you, you heard that... Um, um, uh, Boris Johnson saying that we're going to fix social care. He's, that's been a mantra he's been saying a long time. Um, it's actually largely similar to plans that David Cameron's government had, but they never had the time um, to introduce it. Um, and like I said, it does break the Conservatives' pledge. So that in their manifesto, they said they weren't going to raise VAT or national insurance, and they've just done that. Um, it obviously goes against traditional conservatism, um, but I think the government are taking a gamble here. They're, th they're thinking that the NHS um, and the kind of reputation the NHS has across the UK is definitely worth the gamble of raising taxes. That when you say NHS, people think of it, especially after the pandemic, um, the fact that we clapped once a week for how many months for NHS workers, um, that this is something that most of the electorate will go to accept, that this is important, this has to be done. And I think that he's chosen this sort of imperfect 
risk of this, and it's definitely an imperfect kind of system, um, but he's chosen to, the, the risk of upsetting a um, certain amount of the electorate with um, increasing taxes is, is worth, um, worth the risk. Um, and it's politically better than doing nothing at all and letting um, the social care issues that we have at the moment continue on um, as they have been for decades, really. Gosh, we'll just have to wait and see how this pans out. Thank you, Simon. Let's change gear now and focus on the UK real estate market. Last month, house prices hit a new record high of 0.7% growth month on month. The average UK property was priced at £262,954, 7.1% higher than the same period last year. Though growth appears to be slowing, structural factors such as the demand for more space, the limited supply of properties on sale and remaining tax breaks is still driving record levels of buyer activity. To to talk us through this, I'm now being joined in the studio by Ugo Arinze. Ugo is the managing director of Onyx Property Team. Ugo, it's great to have you in the studio away from a YouTube. I know you're always <laughs> updating your clients on the scene in London, but can you just tell us if you know all of the headlines reflect what's actually happening on the ground? Well, thanks for having me, Juliana. Um, yeah, it has been a whirlwind 18 to 24 months, and it has been surprising how active the property market has been in the face of COVID. But I call it a musical tears moment. I think um, after the first lockdown, people really were assessing their home space and then really just said, is this fit for purpose? We're going to be working more from home. Perhaps people that were renting in central London now recognize that they might be able to live further out. And those fundamental changes of allowing people and acknowledging that people are going to be working from home more has fueled a property market um, and created a lot of activity and excitement. So yeah, we've definitely seen it. Obviously in London, it has been less robust because we've seen a, a significant flight out. But yeah, I think the reality has been that people are um, shifting home spaces in a way that hasn't been seen. And certainly that first, uh, uh, the stamp duty introduction, that holiday really spurred that on and really got the market shifting quite actively. I was going to ask about that because I know the Onyx property team, you deal a lot with international clients, even some clients from uh, Nigeria. Did Were they spurred by that? That tax break because the data does show that it did work people were buying uh, more uh, but what about for international clients did they understand that there was basically a discount yeah look those international buyers do have a somewhat different dynamic um, first of all they physically couldn't travel so we have transacted for some buyers who were still willing to take advantage but those are typically buy to let investors right who are happy to create criteria and as long as we could find that type of property they bought sight on Scene. So we've been able to do those transactions. But for those people looking for that second home, they haven't been able to travel. So we're really excited about the rest of the year for those international buyers. I've got clients actually who've been waiting for six, nine, 12 months to come into the market. And I've got four or five or six of them booked in over the next several weeks because they are actually now physically able to travel. So they haven't taken advantage as much as the stamp duty because, again, they're sometimes at a higher price point, so it's not as significant for them. But they're certainly eyeing and ready to jump back into the market, and we're seeing that over the next few months. Right? Is it a good time to buy, Hugo? I know you're going to say yes, but is it? It's always a good time to buy, depending on why you're buying, right? So if you're buying for space, needs and you're in a rental situation, I would argue, given interest rates, absolutely still a great time to buy. If you're buying because you might want to be taking advantage of additional space and everything, so uh, there's really buying a property, it's housing at the end of the day. So why are you buying it? Are you buying it as a buy to let investment? Then perhaps, yeah, I would still say the yields have been relatively weaker in London, but we're seeing rental rates now at record rates again, so that becomes a, a good criteria. So it's always a good, re, a good time to buy, depending on why you're buying. I've got to ask you before I let you go about where uh, to buy. I know you've always got the insights. A lot of people moving just outside of the M25 or some areas that some would say weren't so luxurious anymore. Where are those places? Well, look, as far as the London boroughs, Bar Barking and Dagenham have some of the best affordability, so definitely people are pushing out that way. Um, if you're looking for more inside and prime central London locations, I'm quite excited about the regeneration around King's Cross. 
Paddington. I was down at Battersea Power Station yesterday. So it really depends where you are on a budget perspective. There's lots of opportunities. The secondary markets of Liverpool and Manchester continue to offer really good yields for investors. So um, it's one of those things we like to sit down, understand what our clients needs or criteria are, and then we can hopefully help point them in the right areas that might suit those best. Always great listening to your insights. Thank you, Ugo. Thank you for having me. And to our next story, Africa's business heroes, the flagship philanthropic program for the Jack Ma Foundation, has selected 20 entrepreneurs from across the continent to compete for her 300,000 US dollar cash prize. The initiative is committed to addressing barriers to economic development and entrepreneurship across Africa. Nigeria has the largest cohort of entrepreneurs with four selected among the top 20. And one of them joins me now. Ohenetega Iyotim is the managing director of GRIT. He joins me from Lagos. Okay, Tega Iotim, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. First of all, I want to send you a massive congratulations, you know, to make it from 20,000, 12,000 um, entries uh, to the top 20. That is a monumental feat because this uh, Jack Ma initiative is well uh, sought after. Can you just tell us how this journey has been for you? Um, I think it's been incredible. It's been an incredible journey thus far. Um, and I think um, for us is a true testament to the relevance of what we're trying to do here at Greek, um, enabling, you know, last mile distribution of temperature controlled products, which affect, you know, healthcare and agriculture. Um, for the longest, I, I've, I've, I've heard, you know, how Africa keeps losing, you know, over 50% of the food produced and how vaccines can get to, you know, millions of kids in the last mile. Um, and it's great to be solving this problem. It's great to have this type of impact um, and getting to, you know, the top 20. I mean, it's great validation for the product that we have, great validation for the solution, which we're also introducing. Absolutely. And not only is it great um, uh, for you and uh, Grit, it's also great for Nigeria. In fact, Nigeria tops the bill. And um, we've got four of you um, that have made it to the final uh, 20. That's definitely something to shout um, about. Um, but there are some concerns. You know, the environment from entrepreneurs um, hasn't been that great. What's your assessment of that situation? Yeah, um, so I think it's a testament to the Nigerian spirit. Um, a true Nigerian is innovative. A true Nigerian is innovative. A true Nigerian you know, tends to find solutions where there are problems. And importantly, Nigeria know they carry last. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I think the environment, yes, like you mentioned, is tough. There are a lot of um, hurdles to cross as uh, a business. Um, but I think, um, like I said, the Nigerian spirit keeps, you know, thriving irrespective of, you know, the challenges. But it will be great, you know, um, for, you um, the House of Representatives, you know, the senators to actually look into, you know, much better policies that enable the um, uh, MS, uh, sorry, the medium <laughs> small enterprises. Um, because SMEs? We, yes, SMEs, because we do, we do um, um, provide a lot of employment in the country. We do, you know, when it comes to capital importation, you see what's happening within the startup environment as well. Um, and so I think they need to actually see that we're not just um, small businesses per se, but we're vital contributors to the Nigerian economy. Therefore, they have to kind of make things better in terms of policy um, for, for us to thrive. Well, I've got uh, my fingers crossed for you, as well as the other 19 um, uh, potential uh, candidates. And no matter what happens, we definitely want to invite you back on Channels Business Global because GRIT is, as you said, providing such a life-changing, life-saving um, a business a solution. Or Kenny Tega, Iyotim, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Thank and good luck. Much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. In a few minutes, I'll be speaking with Shem Benoit Manez. But before then, here's some company news for you. Singapore's Aviation Authority has lifted a two year flight ban on Boeing 737 MAX planes following two fatal crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia that killed a total of 346 people. The aircraft was grounded worldwide from October 2018 to March 2019. Singapore Airlines has six of the planes and plans to take delivery of another eight before the end of the fiscal year. The approval is based on the completion of a technical assessment. Aviation authorities in America and Europe have 
have earlier lifted restrictions. China is the biggest market in the Asia-Pacific region that is yet to approve a return. Japan household spending grew less than expected in July as the spread of the Delta variant of the coronavirus hindered consumer activity. Spending in the world's third largest economy rose 0.7% year on year in July after a biased 4.3% fall in June, weaker than the 2.9% gain forecast by economists. Spending on food, leisure and transportation rose, while spending on consumer electronics, utility payments and face masks fell. The data has fueled concerns that Japan's economy is at risk of slowing down in the third quarter. El Salvador's pioneering adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender was plagued with technical glitches just hours after it launched on Tuesday. President Nayib Bukule confirmed that the Chibo wallet was taken offline following complaints about installation problems. The small Central American nation became the first country in the world to make Bitcoin legal tender in a plan rushed through Congress. Economists in the international financial community have criticized the move. There have also been mass protests by Salvadorans. To our next story, over a million people in southern Madagascar are going hungry and 500,000 children under the age of five are at risk of being acutely malnourished. The humanitarian crisis has several causes, but the headlines have called it the world's first climate change famine. We, along with our partners on the ground, are gravely concerned about the deteriorating situ humanitarian situation in the Grand Sud. A uh, devastating combination of a severe drought, the worst in 40 years, sandstorms, pest infestations have led to crop losses of to 60 percent. People have resorted to eating locust, raw red cactus fruits or wild leaves. More than 1.14 million people are severely food insecure in that area of Madagascar. The funding is urgently needed to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe as we approach the October to April lean season. Our humanitarian colleagues are asking for $75 million before the end of this year to scale up the response. $75 million. It's not a lot of money in the scope of things. To talk us through what's happening on the ground, I'm now being joined by Jean Benoit Manez, the Deputy Representative of UNICEF Madagascar. Jean Benoit, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. I'll get straight uh, to the point. Is there a famine um, in Madagascar? Well, um, thanks for um, this interview. Uh, there's a major drought, and uh, because of its scale, because it's the third one in, in three years, and it's been aggravated by COVID, and of course, there's massive consequences on water, food security, malnutrition, and even health education. And it's our job so far to uh, prevent that it, degenerate, that it does not degenerate into a famine, although we already you can see some pockets and situation is likely to aggravate till the end of March. So I would say that right now we are doing our best working days and night with partners to ensure that it does not worsen, but um, situation evolves and uh, up to 110,000 children are at risk of severe acute malnutrition and 1 million people uh, facing security, uh, food security issue in the south. I know uh, you may be in a little bubble, um, Jean Benoit, not just because you're in a beautiful island um, a nation, uh, but it is uh, very uh, far away. So I know that some of these issues you're used to seeing, um, but of course in the global north they're not used to seeing um, these issues. And there have been uh, some pretty outlandish um, headlines. Why do you think it's taken so long for the plight that I believe has been going on for four years uh, to uh, make the news? Thanks. And as always, I think there are, there are many reasons. Uh, it's a slow onset emergency. The South has always been bad and right now it's just worse. So uh, I think media have taken time to realize that it was actually uh, not the usual situation. Um, we're also on an isolated island because of COVID in a French speaking island in a, a dominantly English speaking uh, region. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, uh, there is little, I would say, uh, strategic issues from Madagascar, meaning contrary to maybe Afghanistan or, or Yemen or, or Somalia, uh, you don't have risk for massive migrations or destabilization of an entire region. We're an island, and what happens on this island stay on the island, which may explain why uh, media haven't uh, relayed the situation yet. Absolutely. Um, there have been some comparisons uh, between what's happening um, on the ground with what's happening in Mauritius. That is a nearby um, island. Obviously, they attract um, more tourist um, um, 
tourists. Uh, but um, some are saying that, uh, you know, they are also facing uh, similar climate um, issues, but their people are not starving. What's, what's the difference there? And do you think that perhaps, you know, some government policies are potentially to blame? I think it's it's easy to, I would say, uh, don't play that comparison because, of course, Mauritius is a small island with only 1.2 million inhabitants, while we are 28 million, and it's more tropical than, than Madagascar, which is married. That being said, there are some good points that you just mentioned, um, notably on how they manage to keep some, I would say, Say of their uh, natural environment preserved, while you know Madagascar uh, is severely hit. Only seven percent of the forest remain, and as you say, uh, they might have benefited from uh, better political stability and uh, I would say economic insertion to the economic world, which Madagascar might not have done uh, at such level. So as a result, we, we do have an island which is uh, depleted of uh, most of its um, natural resources, as far as forests are concerned, and uh, which has been victim of uh, long-term uh, political, uh, I would say, uh, uh, infighting and changes, which make uh, long-term vision more complex. Um, is it possible for you to give us, um, you know, a real-time assessment? Do you have a case study? So, for example, if, you know, a farmer four years ago compared to a farmer now, what's actually happened in their lives? Um, I think, you know, today Madagascar is one of the very few countries in the world where situation has deteriorated since independence without facing a war. So actually, farmers are 30% poorer today than they were the day of the independence. And believe me, they were not rich at that time uh, because Madagascar is facing, uh, uh, with a demographic growth and uh, stagnation of its economic environment. So right now, uh, I would say population are, are, are very uh, poor structurally. And the difference between now and four years ago is that four years ago, they had some very limited, very limited, but existing coping capacity, which they don't have anymore. They've sold everything, they've hit everything that they had. So that would be the difference. Uh, four years ago, they would still have a capacity to cope, uh, sometimes adjust to uh, evolution of the situation. Uh, those days, uh, except uh, in addition, has been affected by COVID. Uh, so there's been uh, some economic impact. Uh, they don't have the capacity anymore. That's the main change. Uh, just before I let you go, um, Jean Benoit, it is being called potentially um, the world's first climate change induced um, uh, famine. Um, I suppose, you know, the climate emergency has dominated um, discussion over the past a few months. But what can be done? Because we know these are long term goals. What can be done in the short term uh, to try and help yeah. these people? I think there are two things that can be done. Indeed, it's a climate change induced uh, catastrophe, but it's been aggravated by local environmental degradation too, uh, you know, with tree cutting and bad management of local water. Um, so, so I think, you know, we need to solve the issue at global level, but here on the island, we can also do our little bit by ensuring that natural resources are better managed and protected. In addition, I think the international com community shall support the government, not, you know, once in a while where there is suddenly an emergency making it in the media, but more on structured plan to be sure that there is a, a long term vision or at least a medium term vision without which no sustainable uh, gain, uh, not a sustainable change, no scalable results can take place. Oh, goodness me, it does uh, sound uh, pretty uh, dire, but there is still hope because we've got uh, UNICEF and other um, aid agencies on the ground. Jean Benoit Menez, Deputy Representative of UNICEF in Madagascar, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.